We've got ITL, corner office, batter's box, all the usual stuff, and engineering royalty. Ed Turney on this week's Pensado's Place. <laughs> you screwed me up. Hey, everybody, welcome. I just got that what the hell are you doing look from her. I, I don't expect it the start of the damn show. I, I, usually you give me like 20 minutes to give me the, like, Dave, you screwed up. What the hell are you doing? My life is on the line and you're doing this. I don't get that look. I don't get that look. But you, I have medical excuses. I have none. And so. you have, uh, you have, um. Golly, I forgot the damn Spanish word for birthdays. That's, I've, that I've, confer- lost, I've lost my Latin card. <laughs> Which would confirm the medical thing that's going yeah, on. Yeah, your cumpleaños. <laughs> oh, man. How are you? You know what? Uh, really good. Uh, did, did my voice just crack? It went a little high. Wow. Really good. It must be those estrogen shots I've been taking. They're working. I, I think I do look a little nicer. <laughs> <laughs> but, man, I'm really excited. I, I'll kidding aside... Um, there's engineers that that I respect and like because they make records I can't make. They're really that talented. And then there's other engineers I like because um, I've stolen so much from them. I've been successful. And then there's engineers that are engineers, engineers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we happen to have Ed Cherney on the show today, and he embodies all of those concepts. I've stolen stuff from him. I admire him as a person, as a human. He's He's a, a fisherman, and you know how much that means to Absolutely. me. He's Absolutely. He's also a boat owner, an operator, and has made some of, some of the best-sounding music just on the mm-hmm. earth, on the planet Earth. Mm-hmm. But I'll describe some of his accomplishments a little later on. And then we're continuing the series on uh, how, to, how to widen your mix, how to get junk out of the middle. You've had an interesting week this week, a couple of... Uh Couple you things. said you wouldn't tell her. Got to tell, man. Listen, you had three number one records oh, in a that. week. Oh, <laughs> you don't mind that, do you? Yeah, man? no, I don't mind that. So the the album that you showed last week, Boney James, came in number one, yeah, contemporary. I'm, yeah. Boney, Lexi, those folks are great folks, oh, and yeah. they take care of us and got great work there. Yeah. Gloria Trevi came in Ooh. number one on the Latin charts. Yeah, big, mi amiga. Big hand in that. And Thank then... You. But let's give a big shout out to Sebastian. Sebastian. Oh, man. We're gonna, my guy. we got to call Sebastian together. We should call. Absolutely. I so, was just talking to Mo uh, uh, earlier today, and, and we're, we're planning pretty seriously our all Spanish show with English subtitles. Who is soon. Mo? Uh, Muhammad Ali. Ah. Uh, he's the gentleman that, that, that slows down the bleeding on the expenses and amount of money you and I spend to <laughs> right. stroke our egos with this so thing. Not, not the boxer, no. the head of sales yeah. for the network. Yeah, gotcha. he's, uh, gotcha. he's from Miami. He's a great guy. Well, we got another number one, too. Michael Jackson, Hollywood Michael Tonight. Jackson. Yeah, that Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson's single is... Congratulations. And I want to give a shout-out to John Nettlesby, my friend, Absolutely. Who, who hooked that up. And then, of course, uh, the legend, the man, the myth himself, Mr. John McClain. Absolutely. A shout-out to him. And uh, and another John at at, at uh, Sony, who you worked with, Don Dell, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So all the or as, and, as we call him in the trade, John D. Right, Mick D. Oh, you know, you, <laughs> well, hey, listen, it's an insider thing. You didn't cross a color line; you crossed a food line with that. <laughs> well, that's all right. <laughs> well, let's cross some homework lines real quick. Okay. So, remember, guys, you can always get us at the usual stuff. Twitter, our Twitter handle is at Pensado Place. Our email is Pensado Place at this weekend, Pensado's Place at this weekend.com. Um, also, obviously, our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. In our corner office, we have the man handling it. Drew Adams is over there. Drew, what's up? What's up, people? How are you? As soon well, as, oh, you? man, look at that. There Drew's we, on TV. There we go. I'm in your TV. There we go. Yeah, you know, you know, I, you know I hasn't been on camera. What? Well, you remember that, that fundraising drive we did? Well, mm-hmm. well all, with all the money you guys sent in, we were able to get Drew the facelift and the plastic surgery that, and the that, that was so needed to, to meet the minimum standards for this show. The swelling. I mean, we have Ed Turney, so you know that the minimum standards are not that high. <laughs> but, well, look at the host. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're hosting it, clearly it's not that high. You said I looked good after the operation. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, so Drew, get in our corner office if you would. That's powered by Ustream, and Drew's going to tee us up in a little bit. Uh, but... But it will any day now. And moving forward, man, let's uh, want to get it cranking. What's up first? Well, it's supposed to be a surprise for you, but I guess that's ruined. Oh, I guess let's go to ITL. Cool. Okay, I, I will, know. you ready? 
Apparently not. Hey, Ben. <laughs> Ian, anybody out there? Oh, oh look at this. Lord, hey, mercy. everybody watch this. Oh, my uh. God. But here's the thing. Are those tombstones? <laughs> 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 okay, everybody. Herb Trowick, it's his birthday today. Oh, so my this God. Is, this is... Everybody wish Herb Trowick a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Those are tombstones, aren't they? <laughs> it's a double knot. Over double the hill, zero. too old to country. Wow. To count. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, so we're going to, we have developed a system on the Internet where we can cut these pieces of cake and get them out to you. So stay tuned. We'll get them to you through the coroner's <laughs> office. Let's, uh, how cool. Thanks, everybody. To the This Weekend family. Such a family for Dave. I, what I really wanted was for them to tee up the Stevie Wonder track of Happy Birthday and have Dave sing it at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. Dave's practice is going to be great. True. Want to go to ITL? Let's do it. Cool. Okay, everybody. We're going to um, continue our series on clearing out the middle. And remember now, this is, this is one of the tools we're, we're using to get our, our mixes wider. And, uh, and and create some depth. So this isn't the end all. It's one of the tools we're going to use later on when we start discussing how to make mixes uh, deeper and wider. I'm going to start by um, by showing you uh, a, a typical scenario where you're putting some reverb on an instrument. In this case, we're going to use a piano, and the reverb takes up a lot of space in the middle. Check this out. Okay, now I'm using uh, I'm using my Bricasti, um, and I'm going to put a couple of plugins on it. We we kind of went over this the other day, um, so I'm going to let you listen while I add these. You see how the reverb cleared out in the middle. I made the I made the piano mono. Now I'm going to mute these again. Okay, now I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to um, get the same effect, but by using the same reverb, but two mono versions of that reverb. Okay, hold on one second. Let me set it up. Okay. I'm going to show you on the guitar part. What I've got is um, uh, we're going to take this guitar part. Here's my sin. Now I'm exaggerating. We're sending it to, to our old buddy D-Verb. Can you hear that? Okay, now watch this. I'm going to show you just the reverb. Okay, now watch this. I duplicate this reverb down here. Now what I've done is I've changed the parameter slightly. Compare these two parameters. They're slightly different. Now I'm going to take this reverb, the, the original one, and pan it all the way left. I'm going to take this, this reverb and pan it all the way right. I'm sending the same information to both. Okay, now let's listen to that. You notice I've got reverb, but there's no middle. Let me take the original signal out. Yeah, cool, huh? As opposed to, see if I can do this quickly. As opposed to that. All right, send your cards and letters, that's good. Okay. I'm going to show you how to clear the middle out just with a pan knob. Okay, here we go. I've got 
uh, I've got four guitars. Let's start with first guitar. Okay, take the effect off, sorry. Second guitar. If you notice, I've recorded it right here, but right now we're monitoring the input from these, these four guys. But I did it this way so I can A-B it real quick. I showed you what I was given. This is what I'm going to do to it. We're going to go through this one at a time. Okay, this guitar, this guy here, you know, so it's a little lower than the, than, than the other side. So I've got it panned a little left, and I've got this one panned a little right. It's not bad. Already we're, we're clearing stuff out. Now, this guitar, I'm going to pan a little to the right. Okay, moving. Now, this, was, this one was hard left and right, but we're, we're tilling it to the right. Now, let's balance it over here by panning this one. Okay, now let's A-B it. Clear it out the middle. It just sounds deeper, you can hear everything. Guitar four and guitar main now have a spot of their own. They're not, everybody's not fighting for the middle. Let me show you the original. Here, here they just disappear. Now you can find them all. It's just panning, there's no effects on that. Okay guys, uh, damn Dave, you running, out, you running out of ideas? I thought you showed me this before. No, I'm not running out of ideas. If you watch next week's show, I'll prove it to you. I'm gonna show you four more ways next week on how to clear out the center. And then, and then we're gonna start showing you how to assemble all of this into the next goal, which is to make our mixes wider and better. But I felt this one was important enough because I want you to use this in conjunction with other things I've been showing you. So like the three things we, we saw today, don't be afraid to add this plug in either before or after to experiment. This is our old buddy, our wave center. And um, just a reminder, Experiment, play with the size, play with all the knobs, good knobs. Um, these presets will give you a little bit of, uh, you can learn how to, you know, how to manipulate this stuff to get different, to get different effects. All right, see you next week. Good job, Dave. I like that. Fantastic. I mean, that guy. I don't know who that guy is. Hey, he's incredible, man. Hey, man, I apologize for just waking up when you saw that, but I think there's some good meat there. And then next week will be the last installment. Uh, I've got some really, really, what I think are kind of interesting things next week for you also. But this week, as I was telling you earlier, I've got Ed Cherney. Um, Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you. I, I can't thank you enough for being here. Ed, 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 Ed. Is it your birthday, Ed? No, but I'm going to I'm going to help help celebrate. Cool, party on. Yeah, I understand we're having some chocolate cake. Well, you know what? It, it, something reminds me of that. I'm not sure what it is. I can smell it. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> exactly. Just dig in, man. <laughs> Here we we use our hands. We no no utensils. Guys, uh, I, I'm going to put it on the spot a little bit here. Ed has has worked with the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, Bonnie Raitt, for which he was nominated. Uh, for that, the, the good one, the good album. He was nominated for uh, Engineer of the Year Grammy and won. I won for the bad one. And, uh, and, uh, and the year that you won, you had three of the five nominated records in the category. And Ed, is, wow. Ed has been nominated six times, seven times, seven times, and won three. He's won six tech awards. Uh, 
on and on and on and on. And then I just recently found out earlier today, Ed started out as an assistant. Well, actually started out the way we all did, driving a truck. <laughs> and uh, well, that was it. That's, that's Ed's quote. And this was in Chicago. And then he, he, he diligently, diligently pounded the streets and talked his way into Paragon after meeting Bruce Swedeen. And a funny story here, they asked him, uh, they gave him a quiz to, uh, to see if he was knew anything to work at Paragon. Mm -hmm. And so he's filling out the quiz, and Bruce Swedeen walks down, and, he, and so he asked Bruce the questions. Bruce gave the wrong answers. He missed all three questions on the test. <laughs> now, Ed, being the polite man that he is, he immediately said he did it on purpose. Ah. To be funny, because Bruce Woodin's that you know he's a real cool guy, but I don't know. <laughs> if Bruce Woodin wants to refute this and be on the show, I'll give him equal no, we'll airtime. So he missed every question on the, oh, and of is. course, not knowing that qualifies you to be an, an assistant engineer, right. he actually did the right thing, and they hired him, and then then spent a little time there and. and uh, Google Ed's name because it's, it, it's a really good story about how someone took him took it under their wing and and and, and uh, I should be letting Ed talk about this but it's my show and then he migrated to uh, he packed everything up he owned both items and moved to Los Angeles and got a job at Westlake and, and you know who his first client he worked with was who? Bruce Swedeen I'll be and, and um, uh, Quincy Jones and the name of the album was probably one of the five most important records ever made uh, off the wall yes. Michael Jackson and uh, Bruce credits um, the experiences that he had at Westlake with with people like Quincy and like Bruce is, is forming into him into the person that he is now the, one of the, one of the all-time great engineers an engineer's engineer so man welcome I, I can't thank you enough and I, I trust you gave a shout out to to your wonderful wife I did She's, I did. Uh, how did she make the cover and of Mix Magazine and we didn't? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. There had never been a woman on it before. And uh, I think they just uh, took the time. Plus, I think um, uh, the editor of, uh, of Mix is uh, a, friend of, uh, a friend named Tom Kinney. And she cooked him a couple meals and, uh, you know, fed him a couple glasses of vodka and he came up with this great idea yeah, that maybe Rose sudden. should be on there. Right that day, but you know what, right she, that she, she deserves to be on there. She's got more no, stories. She does. Rose, mean. you know, in a lot of ways, Rose invented the, you know, the modern paradigm of how you want to run a, a recording studio. I agree. Plus, you know, it, 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 it went from fluorescent lights to, uh, you know, lava lamps and, uh, you know, and tapestries. I still use the lava lamps. She's, uh, she's been a... Uh, a significant part of my career all these years. I met her when I first moved to LA. She took care of me. She always made things easy for me. She helped me out. And as recently as this, we got the uh, the Ricky job through her. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, she said, I said, yeah, I guess you did something for him. She said, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't know. But so many people come, you know, come into our lives or, you know, that show up from years ago and remind Rose of something that, that she mm -hmm. did for them. And with her, it's just so offhanded. Call that guy, call that guy. Yeah, you need, there's what you need to do. And it, yeah. it just doesn't register with yeah. her. But she's profoundly affected the lives of, of, yeah. a lot, of a lot of people. And we should mention she's at Record Plant, Herb. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if, uh, if you need like a $5 discount, just mention Ed and mine's name and I'm sure she'll knock five dollars off your rate. Yeah. Oh, no, what, uh, <laughs> I think what some, someone called her up, and you know they record plant. You know they run record plant like it's the Four Seasons Hotel or you know, right. the Peninsula Hotel. Right. They've always they've always run it. You know. Mm -hmm. you know just, Rick Stevens. Yeah. But I think someone called and they offered. You know they only had a minimum amount of money. And Rose says, I think what you need is a junior studio. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a number for you. Call. <laughs> I think we all need a junior studio. <laughs> I've got one. I've definitely moved into oh, a junior your room, studio. Your room is real, at, at Village, your room is really nice. In fact, I, uh, one of the first things I did after I got out of the hospital, that was after my plastic surgery, uh, was hang out with you at, at Village Recorders. We were working on the new Avid HDIO. Oh, I remember you remember that. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, talking about business and, 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 and how masterfully your, your wife uh, has, has run and turned that process into a business. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of how to take an, an engineering career and uh, uh, 
you, you, you expressed uh, on the internet in a few spots about how the importance of treating that like a business. Can you expand on that for just a couple of seconds? Well, you know, that was something that Swedeen, you know, sitting behind Swedeen impressed on me. And I, and I saw him doing it. You know, the truth is, is we're really artists. And, you know, some people will say, oh, you technicians. You know, that's a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. And artists typically have trouble running, you know, the real side of their lives. You mm -hmm. know, we're living in the clouds in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. no matter how express yourself, you know, we, we may be painting pictures with uh, electrons and air molecules, you know. Um, but you don't think in those terms. And Swedeen, I always noticed what he did every day after the session, he had this pad and a sheet that he would fill out of where he worked, what he did that day, what he worked on, the hours, and the rate. And he put it back in his briefcase and he went home and he was just taking, just, you know, just that part of it seemed like, oh, he was making an invoice and it really, I, it didn't dawn on me. Of course, it didn't dawn on me that, you know, you could make money in the business. Yeah, I was just, right. You know, I was in a studio and I didn't want to go home. I was just delighted to be there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I asked him, I said, so what do you do? He says, well, you know, I take it home and, you know, the accountant gets this, you know, we bill for the time. I think he was uh, actually renting the pencils, the number two pencils. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Bruce. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, he's got a reputation but, for that. But, but he impressed on me, you know, he talked to me about it and says, look, it's really important that you do this. You pay your taxes, you keep track of what you do, um, you, you run it like a business, you, you save your money, you create a pension account if you have to incorporate whatever you're doing, you run it like a business. You know, don't get in trouble with the government, pay your taxes. I, I know so many people that their <laughs> lives have been ruined by that. So yeah. it's just... You know, just, you know, when I have not had an opportunity to make some money, I made sure that, you know, I had an accountant and I, you know, I, I paid my taxes and I, uh, you know, and I just ran it like a business, you know. I That's kept track advice. of everything. And, you know, what happens and when times get slow, and invariably they do, uh -huh. you know, you have some resources and, you know, and your shit is together. And it, and it frees you up to be an artist. That's all you have to think about. You don't have to worry about you got some bill collectors on your ass or you got the government, you know, freezing your 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 bank account. It just it just makes life easier. And you know, I'm sorry to say time goes on and you do get older and you know, and things can will and do change. Mm -hmm. And the way the technology works, the what music is popular and you you know, you may be at the top of the game. You're not always going to be that way and you just Absolutely. have to make sure yeah. that you have resources for when that day comes, and I assure you that that day comes. Guys, I want you to uh, rewind the rewind the uh, the video and check that 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 out again. I, I I can tell you at this point in my career, everything that that Ed has just shared with us is probably the best advice you'll ever get from this show. Ed, how do you like we're perceived as technical? We are technical. We are creative. When you sit down. Uh, to work on a record, how do you balance the technical part and the creative part? I notice with me, um, I'm having to shift left brain, right brain 30 times a minute, and that gets tiring. How do you approach being as incredibly technical as you are, but then also the creativity that you're known for? How do you balance that? You know, I think you do it long enough, and the technical part of it, <coughs> excuse me, becomes second nature. You know, the microphone user, you hear something, you hear some grossel, you hear something clicking, you, you know, I kind of automatically know what it is. And, um, you know, my assistants and people that haven't been doing it that long are kind of amazed. I can go, uh, the clock on the converter is out, or, uh, you know, there's a leg lifted on the cable from that microphone. You know, the technic that's the technical part of it. Solving problems, those, those kind of problems. But and that's what you do. you a gift for that because you, you, you talk about, uh, the proverbial quintessential Cinderella story. He was schlepping gear around for a band. The sound man got drunk or didn't show up. Next thing you know, he's mixing in front of house. Well, but you know, and but it was but good. It, but it was, you know what? Because of the mixer, we only had the vocals, 
And, you know, and I always grew up singing, and I grew up in a family, and we all sang together and take road tricks, and road trips, you know. I and didn't hear my happy mother was a singer, and, and, uh, my, and my, the birthday uh, celebration was coming up. My parents oh, were, you know, involved in musical theater, whatever, but we always sang, we all, you know, all played instruments, and we'd go on these road trips and sing songs. So, you know, you sing harmony, and, mm -hmm. you know, you start to understand harmonies, especially singing with your brother and your sister and your, you know, that makes and your sense. family members. That makes sense. So, because I hear that it was, on your records. So I could, you know, I could balance it. And, you know, it was an eight channel mixer. <laughs> oh, you didn't say that. Knobs, you know, I mean, it, was, it was pretty rudimentary. <laughs> well, of course I could mix it. Oh, feedback off, you know, you learn, you learn those things. I think there was a tone, a high and a low. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that complicated. Well, then you know, I think there, you know, yeah, there was an Eltec uh, 1220 mixer, which I think was an eight-channel mixer, and that was, you know, that was the state of the art then, yeah, in yeah. 1927. I it believe was better it was. than my Tapco that I learned. <laughs> oh, the Tapco was. Uh, I had a Tapco. It had big knobs. It had, but you cracked the knob. You know, I mean, uh, one little thing was 10 dB a gain. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I remember, you know, blowing on the knob to yeah. just try to get a little more gain out of it. So it. How do you get to the point where, like, 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 one of the things I love about your records is, uh, particularly the records that you engineer, track, record, and mix, uh, the vocals are just pristine. Uh, how do you, how do you, not tire the singer out by testing 25 microphones, but just come straight to the singer with the microphone and have it ready to go. Can you explain that process of how, like... Well, uh, I know, you like, know, I mean, typically, typically recording singers, it, you know, it's, I think it's the hardest thing that we do, um, you know, other than getting a good kick drum sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but getting that, and it's, it's problem solving, and, and, you know, and originally I always thought I was trying to find a microphone that would sound the best on a singer, but it's, it's, as, I, um, as I got more experience, I kind of found it was finding a microphone that didn't highlight the bad characteristics of a, of a voice. Oh, wow. So it was problem solving, and I could just hear them out in the room. Well, they sound kind of like that. And I knew I needed a microphone that didn't accentuate those frequencies, something that maybe didn't, you know, hear that stuff that well instead of putting up, a, you know, the best U47. Mm -hmm. But so I just started to get, move fast. <coughs> Get something up and try it. Listen to it, and then you know right away what you have to do. Instead of having them sing over and over again into eight microphones, they're you know they're cooked by the time you do that. Yeah, I agree. Um, was that my phone or yours? <coughs> Could have been um, mine. Um, I was talking with you yesterday, and 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 I was thinking. Uh, we were talking about converters, and, and, <coughs> and we were both talking about how the gap between where converters are now and where we would consider pretty doggone good has gotten so small. Converters are getting pretty good now. Have we reached the point where, where now you pick a converter not because it sounds good, but because it has a unique sound? And are we reaching a point where instead of using a rack of Avid HDIOs or uh, any other single converter, you might actually choose a different converter for your kick drum, a different converter for your vocal, a different I'm not, converter. I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into that. I don't. I don't have the patience for it or the time. Mm -hmm. um, that's. I mean, that's. That's just not me. You know, I feel that. You know, if I have a tin can and a string and the music is happening, <laughs> and, I, and, a, and a two by four, a piece of wood uh -huh. and a hammer. Um, and I, I've got to make music with that. I'm going to figure out a way to do that. Yeah. You know, I was thinking so. in the analog days. Uh, <coughs> I always, we always used to put the kick on, on 24 and the empty on 23, or the kick on one, excuse me, and, and then we put something on 24 that wouldn't interfere with the empty, you know, something kind oh, of low Oh, I started energy. putting the overheads on the outside tracks, one and two, and moving the kick inside because uh -huh. it seemed to, the transients would hold up better. Yeah, empty on 24 and then mm -hmm. maybe skip a couple of tracks. I think we just lost Drew. Drew, you know what a tape machine is? <coughs> tape machine? I've heard of it. Okay, good. It's a thing you put your drink on. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, you know what? Uh, I've often felt inadequate as an engineer because someone told me early in my career that if you're a really good engineer, that you cut. You don't boost frequencies. You cut. And like people told me, Dave Wake cuts. He doesn't boost. And John Gass cuts. He doesn't boost. 
What does Ed Cherney do? I mean, do you? Um, first of all, um, feeling inadequate as an engineer, <laughs> that, that comes with the territory. The whole thing is designed to make you feel inadequate. <laughs> the way the gear is set up, the way record executives treat you, uh, the way some, you know, some people treat you, the way really no one understands exactly it is what you do. Boy, that's the truth. Um, you know, how do you explain, you know, this? Um, you know, I tried to explain it to my parents. No, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to go back to school. I'm going to go do this. You know, what, well, what is that? Well, it's hard to explain. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it took me a long time. You know, it takes discipline to cut. Um, and it took me a long time. I spent the early part of my career just boosting, 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 and I had these records that, you know, you could get on the head of a pin. And that was <laughs> <laughs> because, oh, it made it louder. Oh, that's got to be better. It made it louder. But, so I just, I, you know, I just found that, you know, however you approach it, um, I, I like records, my records to be face coherent, and I found that they were more face coherent if I wasn't adding a lot of EQ. Mm -hmm. You know, you pick your spots, you're always adding some air, um, you're always looking for the fundamental of the kick drum or the low end, but, you know, I've always found that, you know, everything, all the gear, the rooms, the speakers seem to resonate, you know, around 1K, and um, I always find myself trying to make some room, you know, usually around the mid-range, and, you know, clear out there, and then making, you know, you know, the vocal has to speak, you know, in the mm -hmm. upper mid-range, leaving, you know, leaving room for stuff, but being selective about where I'm boosting and, you know, what I'm putting there. Remember Beavis and Butt, her, her Beavis mm -hmm. and Butt? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> he said kick drum. <laughs> 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 the fundamental on the kick drum, explain that to me. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the frequency, the, the, you know, the, I guess it's the first frequency that uh, makes the kick drum a kick drum. Uh, Boof, you know, it's usually, it's usually 40, 50. Yeah it's, yeah, it's usually a note. You can find it. Wow. That's cool. Um, a lot of the guys that watch the show uh, are struggling with stereo bus. It's, 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 it, to, to, when you're first starting out, for me anyway, I didn't put any, I, I, I had 20 number one records and had never put anything on my stereo bus because I didn't know how or why. Every time I put something on the crick, like I was talking to Chris Lord Algae at, uh, you know, where I saw your wife the other day. The other day it was at uh, AES. And I, I, I was, six I was, years ago. No, this was, this was this year. This was this year. And I was asking him his philosophy about the stereo bus because I still don't. I do it, and and I and I think it sounds better. But why? Why? Tell me the why. Why you select something to put on the stereo bus in terms of compression? EQ is obvious, but compression. Why would you select something? When would you select something? And. And what's your go-to thing that you would select for that particular well, problem? It, you know, I call it the engineer's helper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, so, you know, for me, if you do it right, it glues things together. It tends to glue the music together. And if I don't have the wits or the talent or the perception to get really good balances, like, oh, that thing is too loud and that's not soft, a little compression kind of makes that thing that's too loud, you know, it just kind of evens things out a little bit. Uh -huh. It's important not to overdo it. And I think where most people get in trouble is when they have too fast attack times um, on the stereo oh, bus. eats up all the transients and things like okay. that. So you know, the speaker never comes toward you because you're, you know, you're, you know, taking off all the, all the transients. Oh, um, okay. So, so I'll use compression, but I tend to, on the stereo bus, but I'll tend to use fairly slow attack times uh -huh. and um, fairly quick release times. And, and do you but I don't put it on until a lot later in the mix. I don't, oh, so I don't, I don't mix into it. Oh, you don't mix into no, it? No, I'll put it, uh, you know, toward the end, you know, when I'm trying to balance the vocal and, you know, when I'm kind of finalizing things. That's typically when I'll put something in the Do you ever send bus. a version with it and without to mastering and let them master both, both well, versions? Well, you or? know what? I print, lately I've been printing two versions because, um, and I think uh, most of the kids that are watching out there now, if you are kids, are, are slamming your stereo buses, you know, are delivering CDs that are so freaking loud that, um, you know, I find I have to compete that way. You know, for a minute I was turning in some mixes, and if they were 4, 5, 6 dB softer than, you know, what um, a lot of A&R execs were getting because, you know, people are putting finalizers and just oh, really finalizers. slamming it for level, I was, you know, finding that uh, they wanted me to send the song over to somebody else who was going to mix it. Um, when I knew I had a great mix and, you know, it was three or four or five dB softer. So, so what I do now is the, um, 
as I print a mix that I print fairly loud, I'll put, uh, you know, some loudness, and not necessarily an L3, or, but I'll use a Massey or um, an inflator, something like that, to send CD refs to the band, to the, uh, to the record company executives, whoever else is going to hear it, mm -hmm. and I'll make those pretty loud. But, but I'll also print a version that I'm going to give the mastering engineer some room to move that if he wants to add some EQ, he doesn't have to pull the whole thing back. So I'll print two versions, but I'm not going to be remixed again because somebody, you know, sent some CD to somebody that was, uh, you know, 60B louder than mine and, you know, somebody, you know, didn't know how to turn the volume up to hear, you know, if my mix was any good. And, and you know, I know we've had... Have you been, I don't know if you've been up, you know, been up against that thing, you know, the volume wars like that, but... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's It's... I don't mind it when I do it, but when somebody does it to my mix and it alters the sounds, it just, I just I go ballistic. But you and I are blessed because we get to work with guys over and over and over again that kind of know what we want and, and protect us from ourselves. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, we've been, had a little levity here, Herb, so I'm going to get serious for a minute. Uh, pay attention, Ed. Sorry. Ed, what, what, what is your go-to mic for flatulence? <laughs> so, <laughs> can we explain that now? Ed? Uh, if you, yeah, you you want you want me to explain it? Okay. Uh, one of Ed's friends and my friends, Stephen Slate, over at uh, Slate Digital, a great. By company. the way, he has a great compressor for loudness for uh, you know for know. final loudness. Uh, it uses so much DSP, you got to kind of create its own session yeah. for it, but. Boy, it gets things loud without uh, you know, without ruining your mix. Yeah, I met him at the AES where I saw your wife, and he he showed that to me. I was very very impressed. But Stephen decided to do a um, an April Fool's joke, Herb. Mm. So he spent a lot of money and a lot of production, and he put together a video on how to record farts. Nice. And I'm I'm being serious, guys. Uh, my A staff, uh, Ben, Ian, and Will, are going to put a little. A little thing on the on the bottom there. We call them we call it bottom bottom third herb. There you go. And uh, so to show you the link, but uh, there it is right there. I want you to go to this link and watch this video. It is so funny. Ed's in there. Ed is actually miking farts. I promise you, it's really good. Watch it. I apologize, Ed. I told you I wouldn't broadside you, but that's all right. You invited that one, my friend. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm proud of my performance. I, you, know, Steve, you were performing? I thought well, that was really Steve, real. you know, Stephen called me up and asked me if I'd be be involved, and I said, eh, sure, what the hell. But you know, when you're an engineer, you never say no to anything. Oh, no, but but go to this video because uh, he actually goes into mic selection, Herb, and all this stuff. It's, it's pretty funny. But you know what? I, I made it up. I just, I just ad-libbed it. I was just making it up as I was sitting there. I didn't give it any thought, and just that's just what... Just what came out, and I picked the uh, SM7 because, you know, you're talking about getting vocals. <laughs> that's, that's a mic that's gotten me out of trouble, you know, time and time again. You know, so I picked the SM7, I think, for it because uh, it has the, you know, low frequency roll off and boost, you know? <laughs> Dep depending on the timbre you're looking for. <laughs> I was going to ask about your miking technique for that stuff. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a different question. I tried not to do any close miking. Gotcha. I understand actually, why. I had my assistant do the close miking. Gotcha. That's absolutely. I, I, there's a rumor going around that he's actually trying to actively pursue the Preparation H endorsement now. Absolutely. I'm trying absolutely. to get that. Yeah. That's, that's a plug in, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where we go from here. <laughs> well, you know, what we got do, we, what do I do now? Well, we want to go to the corner office? What do you want to do? Let's do. Let's do. I think it's time. Well, is there anybody left to answer questions? Yeah, they've been. Watch us be frivolous. So let's go to the corner office. You want to roll it? There it is. Drew, we're coming back to you, man. What's up, people? Yeah, I got a couple questions here uh, from the Facebook page from Andrew Fox. Um, it's kind of a long-winded question, but here you go. What would you suggest for newer mixing, uh, mixing engineers whose ears know there's frequency buildup, but ears aren't trained to, go, uh, to know frequencies that cut to make room? Would you suggest frequency analyzer or for the more visual learners, or would you recommend only using your ears, like trial and er error method? 
Andrew, I'm, 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 I'm going to answer first so I can intently listen to uh, Ed's answer because I, I know I'll learn something. There's no substitute for just practice, 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 practice. But now there are ways to practice more efficiently, just like in athletics. Um, and, and there's different ways of, of, of immersing yourself. I, I, I always maintain that the easiest thing to do is to teach someone how to EQ a sound, but the impossible thing is to teach them what to EQ. So it's a question and a function of of listening to so much music that you get a feel and, a, and, a, and an opinion of, of, of what music sounds like. And when, when that opinion becomes arrogant in you, then you can start making money inflicting that opinion <laughs> on other people. And at that moment in time, you will have your question answered, Andrew. Let's listen to what Ed says. Uh, visually, I would, you know, I would take a cover and cover up your screen. Uh, a frequency, you know, a frequency spectrum analyzer. It could, could be handy. It could get you in trouble. I think, for the most part, they're fairly meaningless. Um, because here's because they tell you they, they they make you strive for flat, and flat is lukewarm. You know what? Or Close or your what? eyes. I you know I think uh, I don't look at the screen. You know I see. You know what? I play back a record for people, and everyone sits around the console. You know, intently looking at the screen. You know, like you know, just turn that thing off. There's there's two things. I think there's two things you can do. One thing is, go listen to live music in a great space. Go to the symphony. You got a, you know, a symphony hall in your town. Go listen to the symphony orchestra. Go listen to great music in a great space. And that's going to get your, it's just going to get your palate right. And the other thing is, is I think music and what we do is always comparative. How good or bad something sounds. You don't know how good or bad it is until you hear it against something else. And that includes gear and mixes. So go find some records that you really like the way they sound and load it into a couple tracks on the project you're working on and take it out another output and put it on a button and listen to what that is compared to what you're doing and see what's what how you know, it makes you feel. How, yeah, how it makes you feel and how it stacks up to mm -hmm. that. You know, I have you know some songs, maybe I'm working on some things that uh, maybe a little like Tom Petty or something like that. There's some Tom Petty records that I think so, you know I just love the way they feel, and I'll take the, you know uh, you know running down a dream or something like that if it's similar to what I'm doing, and I'll you know and I'll run it, and I'll have it on a button, and I'll do what I'm working on, and I'll just go back and forth between that is and um, and see where I stack up with that, and I think that's that's what you do is compare yeah. your work to what other you know other people are doing, yeah. preferably things you like and, and masters people have been doing it and, and making hits for a long time. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, we got. Um one from EQ32. Uh, how does Ed approach clearing the middle of the mix? I call Dave Pensato. He <laughs> plays his video for me. Just do that. You know, how do you clear it out? It's. Well, why would you want to yeah, first? Yeah. Why would you want to? Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Why would you? Why? Why would you well, want to? Well, uh, clearing out the middle in and of itself is not the point. The point is to create space for the most important things in the mix, which are the, the vocals, and I think, I think you said the vocals, the kick drum, and the bass. I forget what you said in one of your interviews, but, but basically what you're trying to accomplish is um, the three sacred spots in the mix are left, right, and center, and you, and you want to make that center. What you put there, that's what's going to draw people's attention, so you're trying to clear stuff away to make that information more have more depth more i mean that's is that no, kind you, of the way you think you, well yeah, it, i mean it just depends on what the music is supposed to be mm -hmm. you know i'm clearing out yeah clearing out the center for that yeah, but i'm clearing symphony, out but yeah. trying to make space you know a lot of yeah. times i'm getting handed stuff with a hundred tracks of information mm -hmm. you know like what well, uh, you know what am i supposed to do so um you know maybe it's not just clearing out the middle but it's clearing out frequencies and making space so making space so everything speaks in the mix Unless you know you're trying to make make a mix that nothing speaks, mm -hmm. you know I was like, um, you know I spent my career trying to create space. I want to hear everything. I want to hear everything in a place. I want some mm -hmm. width. I want it to be compelling. I want it so you can feel like you can crawl in inside the music. But I was mixing a record for Bob Dylan, and the first mix he you know comes in to listen. And he goes, uh, hey, yeah, this mix is fucked up. <laughs> so what? He says, he I can me. I can hear everything. Mm. So. <coughs> wow. You know, my first thought was, well, God forbid. <laughs> 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 Why did I do that? But, 
<laughs> the truth was is he was right. And as soon I started shoving staff stuff back up the middle and you know, and on articulating things. And you know what? The music felt better and it was more compelling. So, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, it just depends. You have to, you have to be malleable. You have to be yeah. Yeah. know how to do things different ways. Your real job is to really to serve the music, to serve the song, mm -hmm. to serve the artist, and whatever that takes. It may be making it clear, it may be clearing out the middle, or it may be making it muddy and fuzzy. Whatever makes it compelling, whatever mm -hmm. brings the emotion forth, is, that's, that's, a good that's point. what you do. Just because you learn a technique on this show doesn't mean you automatically have to use it every time. I want to share something with you, and I want Ed's thoughts on this. The pan knob is basically two, vo it's not basically, it is two volume controls. So the pan knob, when you pan it left, it's adding more volume to the left speaker than to the right. So there is no such thing as the middle. It's, it's a, a, uh, someone on the internet described it as, as a phantom sound. That sound doesn't exist. If you have, the sound is coming from this speaker, sound is coming from this speaker, but you perceive it as being the middle because the pan knob is sending the same amount of information to each speaker. With me, Herb? Mm -hmm. And the old consoles actually, the old consoles actually had no pan knob, Ed, right? But they had a switch that you pan left, you could pan it right, and you could put it in the middle. So those were the only three spots, and that was stereo. Mm -hmm. And to the day, that's still stereo because the human ear doesn't have the ability to hear those minor distinctions between dead center and right as well as they can hear that. So the reason I'm bringing this up, EQ22, is I want you to think about that, and that'll help you understand how the parts and the and the different spaces within the stereo frame work. The stereo is is an artificial medium. It's not in nature, but it's the best approximation we can get to feed information to both ears, and the ears hear that information at slightly tiny microscopic differences in time. The brain processes that and can figure out where that's coming from. So the process of stereo is to manipulate the brain. So that's another show for another time. But it's to tell you where the animal is coming from that's going to eat you. That's true. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's right. Drew, or, the, or the or the A&R person that's coming <laughs> from is going to bitch you out. Same thing. Uh, we got another question from Jonas Frank. Uh, basically, he just wants uh, you guys' opinion on how to uh, deal with phase issues. That's a little broad. Is it Jonas or jo uh, Jonas Frank? Yeah. Jonas, that's a little broad. So I'm gonna give that one to you, Ed. You know, phase. It's important that you know that your speakers are in phase. Um, I would invest in a phase checker. You can get them all over the place. It has a sender that sends a pop and a receiver that hears it and uh, either shows an LED or makes a sound telling you you're in phase. That includes the cables you're using. That includes where your speakers are set up. Mm -hmm. um, every tracking gig I do, I ensure that my, the microphones are outside are all in phase with each other. And I really want my recordings to be so that the first transient, the first sound is moving the speaker toward me. Um, I just find my records sound better if that's way that you do. So you pay attention to it. So, you know, you're going to spend a day or two going through your rig. Um, if you're using Pro Tools, I see so many times that you listen to phase all the way through your Pro Tools and everything is in phase when in fact, it's 180 degrees out because the way some people, their cabling works, um, you know, going to the wall or however you're getting to your speakers. Is there and sp in studios in particular, for a long time, the standard now is pin two hot, which mm -hmm. is around the world, but for a while it was pin three hot yeah, in some a lot places. Of gear was pin yeah, three. so, you know, you would just get burned all the time. Is there a website that, that you can direct someone to to learn more about this? www.inphase.com. I thought so. No, I, I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking there, prob there probably is. Okay. Right. In fishing, we use phase as the moon cycle. So the, the Figure out the tide so you don't run aground out there down yeah. in the Keys. Thanks, Jonas. Uh, we got a true-false from Matt Pugh. I, I love you, Matt. I've been begging my audience for true-false <laughs> questions for, for 13 weeks. There we got, uh, all right, adding an L2 after compression to EQ on a vocal can help it stick out of the mix even more. Read that again. Adding an L2 after compression to EQ on a vocal can help it stick out In of the mix. In addition to even. compression. It, yeah, and, on top of it. Eduardo? You know, I get um, stuff to mix that uh, bands and people have been working on for a while, and um, I hate seeing L2s on individual instruments. It just drives me crazy, you know. It's, there's... 
you know, maybe every, every now and then it's okay, but as soon as I see that, you know, I can see that it's an amateur that's doing it. Um, I, I just don't, I don't like the way they sound on individual instruments. Yeah. It takes all the dynamics out. It's just here. For me, I, I you know, I, I just, I, I don't like, I wouldn't do it. Okay. There's other ways to, to get the gain up. That's what I was going to say. I think there's better ways. I think if you, if you pay attention to some of the earlier uh, ITLs, you, 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 with a little imagination and a little stretching the techniques, I think you'll find a better way to do it. L2 is, is one of the great inventions of the digital age, but it's probably the most misused invention of the digital age. Uh, and sometimes it's misused in ways I really like, and sometimes it's not. And uh, I think the, the, the best thing that we can tell you, Matt, is find other ways for now and, and learn those other ways and then go back to the L2 and choose which sounds best to you. That's what you're going to have to earn a living with eventually anyway, your opinion. So might as well get that up to par. How's your, um, how's your arm? You ready to throw some pitches? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I think it's time for the batter's box. I know. And in the batter's box, my yeah, man Ed's Ed. evil twin. <laughs> Ted. Ted Cherney. Ted Cherney's here. <laughs> Fred, Fred Cheney. Fred. Put me in coach. I'm ready to play. There we go. Run the graphic, Will. He already did. No, he did? Yeah. He Run just, Dave, Will. Cue up Dave. <laughs> okay. For those of you new to the show, uh, in response to some of you that like your information spoon-fed to you quickly and without hyperbole, this segment, I'm going to ask Ed several different uh, tracks, instruments, sounds, and, and he's going to, as if he were on a psychiatrist's couch, he's going to word associate his go-to EQ and his go-to compressor. Are we ready? We'll, we'll forget the, the other thing right now, but the okay. compressor and EQ. Can you remember that, Ed? Yes. Okay. Are you ready? Mommy. Huh? Mommy. Uh, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to do that one. Yeah, I'll do this one. Lead vocal. 33609. Ooh. Good choice, Ed. Compressor. I like 33609. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been finding myself using that. And uh, I like the GML uh, 2200 um, EQ just to start out and because I can get a really sharp cue, you know, and dip nasty stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been using the Fairchild on the back end of it, which I find, which I've been really, you know, depending on the style of music. Yeah. Okay. 660, 670, okay. I've, been, I've been liking that. But 33609 to start is, is wow. definitely a, is my go-to. Cool. I, I saw that Umberto Gatico was using one of those, too, and I said, oh, my buddy. <laughs> and then I remembered, I think I assisted him and maybe have stolen that from him, and that's why, that's why I use it. Everything I do has been taken from someone that preceded me. That's true for all of us. I mean, we didn't invent much of anything. Rock guitar. Uh, like a Bonnie Raitt style guitar. Or a Stones guitar. 1176. 1176. Slow attack, fast release. Um, and, I, you know, and I like the SSL uh, G, G Series EQ on those. So I, like the, I like that a lot. Okay. Fuzzy. Uh, acoustic piano. EQ or you don't use no stinking EQ on an acoustic piano if you're micing it if you're micing it right if you're micing it right you don't you don't need it but I saw you were you, on one of your things you were working on a piano depending on what it is you should be able to mic an, a, a, an acoustic piano that's set up right and I mean tuned and voiced right and mic it and not have to use EQ now when you try to fit it into a rock track that's a whole nother thing and you know you use whatever you can maybe you're going to mono it maybe you're going to put distortion on it, uh, you know, you're, you're going to do different things, but piano, mic choice and placement. Okay. I like the uh, LA-3 on the, on, for compression on pianos. Do you, is that your go-to? Um, LA-3 ain't bad. And by the way, LA-3 is really good on rock guitars, too. Oh, really? Just, uh, yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Uh, live strings, same thing? Same thing. My, you know, mic, mic choice and placement in, in a great space. Overheads. Fairchild, Fairchild, 670s. Really? I like 670s a lot. For, uh, you know, for that, for that, that kind of thing. <laughs> you, could, you know, if you want them to pump and breathe, uh, Fairchild does, does that really well. Wow. I, I have to try that. I want to try it. Make them know that. Herb. And, uh, and, and, and the SSL uh, G-Series, um, 
EQ. You know, I kind of like I, I like been using that too. I've been using the Waves uh, SSL a lot and kind of been going With to Chris's that. Chris's presets? Uh, no. <laughs> Come on, man. No. I know you use Chris's presets. I use Chris's presets. I'm sorry. I I, like you Chris's know what? Presets. I I take umbrage at presets. Oh, you do? Yeah. I like them because they're great. And everyone raves about them, but you know what? Do the work, people. Figure out your own thing. You know, that's just yeah. The, no, you I, know, I, I agree with 100. Sometimes you know, I, get, I like get your own. Get your own style. Figure you know. Figure I don't it like out. reading manuals because I'm a pro, and if I have to read the manual, it's designed wrong. So I like um, I like to use the presets to see what they're doing a lot of times. First of all, with those presets. They're dirty, rotten liars. They're lying. They're not giving you. Well, you know, how can you have like, a preset for everything? Yeah, ex exactly. You know, I'll tell you. You want like just Herb, a, it's like Herb's plug in the uh, suppository plug. -in. <laughs> not for everything. It's not, yeah. a, it's not just, for just everything. Just a very thing. specific use. It's more for recreation rather than med well, medicinal, right? That depends on other things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I remember just in Chicago when I started out, and it was a big deal. And Bruce went to some Swedeen went to some studio and did a tracking date. And they basically welded the console with his settings, you know, for his <laughs> tracking date. And, you know, even that, it was like, oh, like, wait a minute. You know, it's like, you know, the first thing I knew was like, well, that's not going to work because, you you know, this is the kind of thing you can do it exactly the same way every time. And it's yeah. always different. You know, it's always different. You know, it yeah. just. Okay, guys, I want, you to, I want you to rewind that again because that's why I always tell you don't exactly copy what we tell you on the show, but use that as a starting point. Use that as a way to to verify that the things that you came up with are valid. And that's even a strong statement. Just use it as confirmation that you're good because you're doing something similar. Can, can, yeah, can, can I mention that it's important to develop your own sonic signature? Yeah. And however you do that, you know, it's screw what everybody else is doing. Come up, you know, follow your heart. Be yourself. That's all you have is yourself. So come up with your own unique way of doing things and sounding and that's how you'll be recognized and that's how you'll have a career I think. One more pitch Ed, uh, acoustic guitar. Uh, EQs or uh, both, EQ and compression. I like 1176's you know always and um, any small condenser, oh, we're not doing microphones, EQ. Oh tell me, uh, 451? It, you know it depends, uh, yeah 451's are great, I got a B&K 4011 that Ooh, I really wow. like. Those are um, expensive. But yeah, um, um, I like those, but then again, it depends on who's playing it. If Dean Parks is playing the guitar, you can put just about, you can probably put a, a large condenser diaphr diaphragm microphone, a C12 or something like that, and it'll sound great. A lot of uh, acoustic guitar players aren't that great, and they're scratchy and lumpy, and sometimes you get boominess and stuff like that, but when you have a great musician, you can, you know, put a, a large diaphragm on there and it'll, you know, and you won't need a compressor. They'll just have that feel and touch and then right. and the musician will make you the genius. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true for everything. The musician or the producer makes, always makes us look yeah. good. Yeah. Did I ask him about a bass yet, Herb? Nope. Bass? 1176. Yeah. Snare drums, 1176. Oh, what else? I, I like. Kick I drum? just like 1176s. You know, hopefully you don't need a compressor on the kick drum. Although the truth is, most of the time you do. And um, <laughs> I read one where, one place where you were using uh, the um, transient designer and then mixing it back in with your original sounds. Yeah, that or, or you know. I just, do that, but I never did it on a live track. But it works good on live tracks. Yeah, that you know that can work. You know, you, you know what the truth is is. And I'm an idiot for doing it, and and I work slow. I, I never, you know, I don't have a real formula that I use that, you know, this is the thing for this. I try to do it different every time to create a unique sonic personality for the song I'm working on, mm -hmm. which invariably, I wouldn't recommend it because it drives people crazy, you know, like, what's taking them so long? But I'm just trying to create something new and different every time I do it. I don't always succeed, but I want you to hear four bars of, of what I did and have it be recognizable as something unique. Well, and you, in, our and culture, in our culture right now, th and the way pop music is now, um, it's probably not the greatest idea because, no, uh, because, conform ever, because con conformity is, is important, but I, I've never been one to conform and I've always gone my own way, but um, I wouldn't recommend it because it'll make your life harder yeah, <laughs> in but, a lot of ways. But, but, but. You said earlier that <clears throat> when you got into the studio the first time when you were just starting out, you didn't want to leave because um, it was just so wonderful being there. Where have you heard that before, Drew? Yeah. 
I was the same way. I didn't want to leave. And I think that kind of enthusiasm is the foundation for, for all your success that has followed because it, that's what motivates you to be unique and that's what motivates you to take the extra time even though a, a lot of people aren't going to hear it, a lot of people aren't going to pay you for it, and a lot of people are going to penalize you for it. You still have to do it because that's what makes the process fun. You know, you know what I'm saying, Herb? It's like, it's, it's... I wouldn't call it fun. I, I, I find it more torturous. Um, well, you know, really, hit, just yeah. fun, you know, figuring out what it is. I, you know, I, you know, I relive my whole life, you know, in every mix, you know, every yeah. thought, everything, just, you know, struggling through it to try to find something unique. Um, and uh, But that's the, that's the artist side of you that you were referring to earlier. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily fit into the world of commerce that we live in, oh, no, you no, know, no. and the way the whole thing is set up. It's, it's to your detriment a lot of times. You're maybe better off having a formula because a popular culture and popular music right now really wants things to conform and you know the no. next thing to sound like the last thing is it is it too corny a, a metaphor to say uh cats like you are a tailor that you go and they measure you and create a suit just for you whereas a lot of the mixed world is target or walmart you just walk in and grab a suit off the shelf and yeah, if it fits good if it doesn't fit good is, is that a, an appropriate metaphor I think it's an appropriate metaphor, unfortunately. And, and unfortunately, and a lot of the popular music we're making now is, uh, I don't think it's you're going to be hearing it in ten or twenty years. I don't think you're going to be hearing it in a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hearing it's what? something that's popular and a hit today. I'm I'm not sure it's going to be, you know, playing on the radio or in anyone's lexicon next year or in twenty years. It's not going to be, you know, you're not going to be, you know, like Led Zeppelin we're listening to so much later or. The Beatles, or you know, a lot of things that mm -hmm. you know that have forty and fifty year shelf lives, and are probably going to be you know with us as long as civilization is with us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we're necessarily making that music now. That's popular music. People are making that music, and mm -hmm. you know, it exists, but you know, it's, it's not at the forefront now. of our culture. Sometimes I think our profession is like that old saying, why, hey man, why are you hitting your head against the wall? Because it feels so good when I stop, you know? Yeah. Mixing is a lot like that. The, the fun part is when you stop and you get to listen back to what you've done, but the process of hitting your head against the wall can be a little frustrating sometimes. Yeah. I, I think the fun part really, you know, it can be torturous. I think the fun part is when the artist that you're working with hears it and, you know, you know, cries or laughs or hugs you or, uh, you know, pays you. That's, that, that's the fun part. Ed, what's the, um, what's the one question that you're always disappointed that no one ever asks you after one of these torturous sessions? Is there one? It's, you know what, when I say it's torturous, I don't, you know, you know what, you, you know, I've been giving that thought and there isn't one. Um, you know, you know, you brought that up before and I've been thinking about it. Um, usually people are telling me things. <laughs> 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 Well, can, can, uh, in the couple of minutes we have left, can, can it just be you and me in a room alone for a second? Sure. Like, that's, like, the, that's the best part. Like on that, uh, what's the girl from Canada, Jane? Oh, Jan Arden. Jan, Jan Arden. Arden. That record is genius, Ed. I, I, Great. I listen to that and uh, it's an ego check for me because just when I think oh, wow. I'm really, Thanks. really good and nobody can touch me, I, I listen to that record and it's just humbling what you've done with that. Uh, the artist is J-A-N. Jan, J A N N, Arden, A R D E N. We made we made a bunch of records together. What's the one? What's the one that I like? It's, it's one of the earlier ones. Um, uh, probably insensitive, maybe. I think that's it. Uh, no, you. I won't. I won't sing. Sing it. Sing, sing, sing. I know you won't remember me. I know it's ancient history. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Can you kind of delineate? We've got about four minutes left. Can you kind of delineate the process from? Inception to well to the way Jan mastering. the way Jan wrote uh, that particular song she didn't write, um, and she's a great writer. Where you did know? you record that? We recorded that at Jackson Brown Studio in Santa Monica, only a few blocks right right down the street. Uh, his Groove Master Studios. I think right. we did a most track most of her records that I did together. We did five or six records together. And you had some pretty talented musicians on that. You know, I'd now. bring in, yeah. You know, I put a <laughs> great band behind her. She, you know, she was basically a busker. You know, she played, a, you know, guitar on the streets of Vancouver. You tracked, produced, and uh -huh. and mixed everything. And, and, yeah, and mixed it. And those are the days. You know, I insisted on mixing, and the label would always come back. You know, they'd want another mixer, and I would take umbrage. What do you mean? Ah, I'm gonna mix. You know, and. 
now it would be like, oh, you got somebody that's going to mix that? Great! <laughs> Make it a hit. <laughs> did you, uh, did you, you track, respect you. when you were tracking, did you track uh, drums, bass, and guitar first and then go back and overdub vocals and fill mm, in the other I tried parts? To do, I tried to do as much as, as we could. I would, you know, it would be um, bass, drums, couple guitars, give her a guitar, keyboard. Um, I I'd have her singing live, and invariably a lot of the vocals we got were done live off the floor. You had that good There's isolation There's something there? about, yeah, yeah, and even, you know what, even if there wasn't, a lot of times the performance trumped the sound. Um, and that's where uh, SM7s and RE20s come in too. Sometimes I'd have her out in the room with everyone playing and I'd get a, you know, a dynamic microphone. And I felt I'd always get a pretty good vocal sound on her, and it didn't matter what microphone I used a lot of times. I just wanted to get the performance. And if I got a great performance, I could get it to sound good enough. Wow, and those, those, those vocal mics were just one mic? You never used a double micing technique on the vocals? Mm, no. I, sometimes I did. Um, you know, like uh, a Bonnie Ray records I would, because a lot of times her verses were soft, and she'd blow up the mic in the choruses, so, you know, you'd have to But you to, never had both mics playing at the same time in the final <coughs> one? Um, it was one or the other? Pretty much one or the other. One last thing. When you mention Jackson Brown, I always think of David Lindley, who's one of my favorite guitar players in the world. His tone, his sound, his feel. He, David could get as much with one note as, as a lot of guys get with 200. Uh, did you ever work with him? Yeah, I did a record with him. And that's how I, funnily enough, I got to, uh, I, was start, I was doing a lot of jingles, but getting to do records from beginning to end. This I, was in I, Chicago? No, this was uh, here in Los Angeles. Oh. I did a Rikuda record. Oh, we met. Right I was there. doing jingles, and we met. And uh, he was doing kind of a Delco commercial or something. Hired uh, me. You know, he wanted somebody young. To, so I did the Delco commercial with him, and I ended up doing a Rikuda record. Um, the name escapes me now. Uh, well, uh, Flocka, get get Flocka. rhythm, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flocka was on. Flocka was on. And, I guess David heard it, and then I got hired. Linda Ronstadt was producing a David Lindley. It was David and his band El Rayo X, El Rayo yeah. Eke. That wasn't the first David Lindley record, was it? I think there may have been one before it. But the anyway, I ended, up, like yeah, I ended up doing favorite. this record and had a great time, and I hit it off with Dave. He's just... He's a little know, eccentric, he's a, right? Oh, he's... No. He's, he's, he's funny. He uses, he uses like this old vintage, I mean like vintage vintage stuff, like just crazy yeah, like stuff. Like anybody else couldn't get him in tune and he'll pick yeah, a guitar but, and he can just finger but, it uh, and fix the intonation. All those just Jackson the way he Brown plays records, it. those the soaring little, they sound like violins, his guitars. Yeah. And then I used to always make fun of accordion players till I heard Flaco Jimenez on the, on the Rikuda records. This guy is the... Is the they call them squeeze boxes, I guess. Yeah, we really did a cool. song called Across the Borderline, Flacco Player. Oh, I do remember man. that, you know, like it was yesterday. I'd love to meet him. Sometime. Anyway, I got to do a David Lindley record, and it was always fun. And, Dave, and you know, not people know that, but David is a, a championship marksman. Wow. And I remember, you know, in the studio, he he'd have cases people's. and cases of guitars. I remember, you know, you were going to do a, do a guitar part or something. You opened it up, well, not that one. You know, he had a, you know, some high power. We're going to do it into the uh, layer some, some who not to mix for yeah. soon. Don't mix for those kind of guys. <laughs> don't mess with him, whatever you do. Ed, uh, I don't recall when I've had more fun or, or learned more or been so inspired. I, I can't thank you enough for doing the show. You, I know you're incredibly busy and and. It meant a lot that you came by and hung out with us, man. Yeah, well, I'm really pleasure. not that busy. I really don't have much else to do. Dave, you know what? I feel the same way, and I'm so honored and, and privileged to come here and spend uh -huh. the time with you. Thank um, you. You're somebody Thank that, you. I, that I admire and admire for a long time. Thank you so much. And, and Thank you so much. Uh, and in terms of thanking Ed, thank you again for coming. Thanks to all you guys for tuning in. Apparently, we're getting record numbers of people in the corner office, and a couple suggestions came through in the chat room about keeping it open after hours, which is something we'll, we'll take into consideration. Thank you for the birthday wishes and the well, other stuff. We're going to have the cake. Now, by the way, I was offered a free T-shirt. I'll take the it's XXL. Coming. It's inside the cake. <laughs> and once you dig into it, uh, remember uh, all the homework stuff, Twitter handle at Pensado's Place, Pensado Place at thisweekend.com for email, Facebook page, YouTube page. Drew, thanks from the corner office. Hey, thank yeah, you Drew, guys. keep Drew, those coming. Job. And also, you know, we want to thank you guys on top of uh, a lot of requests come through the corner office and through the this weekend social media stuff for Dave and speaking things and mixes and so on and so forth. Dave, this is where this is. Where, <laughs> he does this, this to me all This is working time. for you. <laughs> so, so I uh, thank you. Now you can wrap up. <laughs> no, man. You just do that to me all the time. I want you to see how it felt. It feels good, <laughs> guys. Uh, I, I tell you, this much fun is probably illegal somewhere. I really appreciate you hanging out with us and giving us the opportunity to act a fool in front of you. 
and we'll see you next week.